This is Relentless Daring on Podbean.com. Welcome back to the land of bourbon and bad decisions. This is Relentless Daring live on Podbean.com and the Podbean app or wherever you happen to stream your favorite podcast, Stitcher, Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, wherever it is, you can listen to it. Or if you follow me on the Facebook page for Relentless Daring, guess what? You can listen to your podcast right there on the Fache book because <laughs> it publishes there too of all the darndest places. Hey, I will take whatever I can get. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I've got a heck of a show this week. I've got writers saying that parenthood should be abolished. Democrats lack any and all self-awareness when it comes to the filibuster in Russia. We finally have an arrest. After one year, we finally have an arrest and a charge of sedition for 1-6. And the big story of the night well, it turns out people are a little a little off their rockers when it comes to the SCOTUS ruling on the OSHA mandate. I've gotten one wonderful article from the Atlantic. Yeah, that's from the Atlantic. We take ourselves so seriously here that, yeah, it was the Atlantic. But first, let's talk coffee. Better yet, because it's an election year and we have to choose where we are going to go. Are we going to stay on the same road? Are we going to try to find a new path to try to turn what has happened over the past 50, 60 years, turn it around? A time for choosing, if you will. And so what could be a more apropos coffee for kicking off an election year than a time for choosing blend from APR Coffee? In 1964, the great communicator gave what may have been the greatest speech of the 20th century. He reminded us that there isn't left or right, only toward freedom or down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. As you make your choices in 2022, please enjoy this powerful blend of Burundi, Ethiopian beans, and remember the brilliant American wisdom he left behind. Again, American Pride Roasters has so many great flavors of coffee. I'm totally digging the On the Roof and Teddy Roosevelt blends. By far my favorite. You know, and if you have one of those machines with the uh, copyrighted name that I can't say, guess what? He even sells the cups that goes in those. So you can run your single-serve coffee brewer and, you know, and have some of your favorite blends for it. Or maybe you want a snack. They have some great things like coffee drops available. You know, a little sweet caffeine blast to get you through get you through your day. Again, go to aprcoffee.com. And then at checkout, you'll see special instructions. Put in there that you heard about them from the Relentless Daring podcast. That way when you submit your order, they know, hey, Giving him stuff to advertise for us is paying off. APR Coffee, American Pride Roasters Coffee. Historically, great coffee. All right, so getting into things, I don't even know where to start. I think, I think the first place... And it's the easiest one to start with, honestly, because it's not going to completely derail everything. If I if I, if I start with the the Atlantic article, the, this whole show is shot because I'll just be stuck on that for an hour, and <laughs> I have things I need to talk about. But again, after a full fifth. Three weeks from the time the first barrier was breached on 1-6, we finally have an arrest. 
not for parading, not for criminal trespass, not for impeding an official process or blah, 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 whatever trumped up charge they're trying to get to punish a bunch of, uh, a bunch of stay at home moms and a bunch of Karens who walked through the, walked through the Capitol building with their Yeti cups filled with wine. No, no, no. We finally have the key ring leader himself. Stuart Rose, the leader and founder of the far-right Oath Keepers Militia. Yes, we finally have him. A man who was so instrumental in leading this horrible act of sedition against the federal government. That they served one warrant. And they took one cell phone. It was not right away, even though they knew right away he was involved. No, nay. They did it last April. Four months? Four! A mere four months. After conspiring to commit the greatest atrocity in the history of the United States. Far worse than 9-11. Far more deadly. Then the day that shall live in infamy, December 6, 1941. Yeah, that is how they're acting about Stuart Rhodes finally getting arrested for sedition. Now, I may have some issues with the, uh, with the charges because... Was he really being seditious? I mean, you could make the argument that he was. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I believe that if he was responsible or played a major role in everything that happened on January 6th, whether he went into the Capitol or not, let the man have his day in court. Let prosecutors put the charges and the evidence in front of a jury. Let's see what the jury says. However, there are a lot of questions. Why did it take a year? I mean, Ray Epps, a guy who was known to the FBI within days. They knew his name within days. Yet to be charged. Huh. That's so weird. And there were and there were people who were defending Ray Epps. Um Well, you know, he didn't go into the Capitol, man. Well, okay. But he was there the day before. When people were rallying outside the Capitol the night before, he was standing up on camera. Hey, we need to go into the Capitol, man. And he was getting shouted down as a fed. Because, huh, the people who were there kind of had some suspicions about someone trying to stir the pot and get people to go into the building. And then the next day, the day of the actual rights, he is right there at the barriers, whispering into a dude's ear, and then just a few seconds later, the dude is ripping barriers down and charge, leading the charge on the Capitol that Ray Epps never went in. And I, I've seen this rip passed off as, oh, that's protected speech, man. Okay, um... If that's protected speech, well, I mean, you you would have to agree with it because, I mean, uh, Aunt Auntie Maxine telling people to get in the faces of members of the administration and tell them that you don't want them here and to harass 
confront and harass them. That wasn't incitement. It was free speech. She was encouraging engaging with members of the Trump administration. And, and I'm sure Ray Epps urging people to go into the Capitol, but that's, again, that's free speech. And I'm sure he wasn't telling the dude who ripped down the ripped down the barriers. I'm sure he wasn't telling him to rip those barriers down. I'm I'm sure he was telling he was, he was just whispering sweet nothings in his ear. Yes. Oh yeah. That black helmet looks so good on you. You know, it would be really hot if we just got out of here. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. But, again, there's so many questions. Again, just earlier this year, I spoke with a guy who, when approached to be a confidential informant by the FBI, he said no. and is now on a terror watch list. I'm probably on the list, too, because I had the audacity to speak with someone on the terror watch list. <gasps> bum, bum, bum. Oh, wait. Uh, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Absolutely nuts. Now, and I'm sure there's people like, oh, yeah, man, just some dumb army veteran and, you know, he's just an idiot, and look what he did. Yeah, um, the dude graduated from Yale Law. He graduated from Yale Law, oddly enough, a year after um, National Security Advisor, yeah, National Security, White House National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. They were classmates. They didn't graduate together, but they went, they attended the same law school. I'm sure they knew each other, which I'm not trying to create any conspiracy theories that there's a connection here. It just seems odd. But, you know, some other noted Yale Law graduates include the currently disbarred former President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Also a graduate of Yale Law would be... One Hunter Biden. Again, I'm not saying there's anything out of the ordinary of these connections. It's just, you know, sometimes coincidence is just a coincidence and a cigar is just a smoke. And there's, you know, not any other salacious uses for the cigar. But this is one of those things. This is kind of curiouser and curiouser. But anyways, now that I've breached that, or not breached, (laughs) now that I have broached that subject, everybody loves their parents, right? I do. Well, because, you know, parents, they, they provide such a great, okay, I'm going to say they all provide great role models for kids. They do kind of, good ones do. However, there's starting to be a movement from certain people that, well, maybe parents, maybe we shouldn't have parents. Maybe we should, you know, abolish parenthood in the name of equity. <laughs> yes, that's right. Headline, leftist writer calls for parenthood to be abolished to achieve equity. Says your children should be given to homeless neighbors or to the state. Ha, 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 yes. Let's give your children to the state. Because what could possibly go wrong when your child is a ward of the state? I don't know. How many stories of abuse exist that creates a huge negative stereotype that good foster parents have to overcome. It, 
it's 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 ridiculous that we would want to put that we'd want to put these in, put kids in as wards of the states. Bad enough, they're wards of schools for eight hours a day. But anywho's, a writer is proposing that California abolish parenthood so that the state can achieve true equity. The outlandish proposal was presented in an article published in the opinion section of the Ventura County Star, a daily newspaper published in California. The publication is owned by Gannett, the largest newspaper company in the United States. The article titled, California Should Abolish Parenthood in the Name of Equity, was also republished by Yahoo in its news section. The author of the piece is Joe Matthews, a co-president of the Global Forum on Modern Dis- Modern Direct Democracy. Modern Direct Democracy. Mob rules, chaos reigns. Which is, quote, dedicated to those active on issues of direct democracy, participation, and citizens' rights around the world. The article touts Californians as having the goal of equity to be their greatest value. However, Matthews notes that parenthood prevents the true equity because because fathers and mothers with greater wealth and education are more likely to transfer these advantages to the, to their children, compounding privilege over generations. Right. To combat this perceived inequity, Matthews presented a solution of making Raising your own children illegal. The radical proposal calls for wealthy parents to trade kids with poor families and vice versa. Because that's all your children are. They are chattel. You're treating them as property if you're trading them. Hey, man, I'll trade you my, I'll trade you my cisgender white male for your for your transgender black non-binary person. It's like, seriously, <laughs> have we lost our damn minds? It's California. Don't answer that. It was rhetorical. We all know they've already lost their damn minds. Matthews, who describes himself as a dad in his Twitter profile, even suggests homeowners might swap children with their homeless neighbors. Yeah, because giving your kids to homeless people who are hooked on smack would never be a bad idea. You're already giving your children to them as chattel, not because... Well, the additional life experiences will make them a better and more rounded person. Um, yeah. What happens when homeless Bill decides that he needs more heroin? Uh, You know what? He can pimp this sweet little eight-year-old girl that he got, or nine-year-old boy that he got from the Stevensons in the really big McMansion next door to the homeless camp. He can pimp them out for freaking drugs. Oh my God! What? Why could you? Why would you say this would lead to human trafficking? I don't know because it will. They say the slippery slope argument is a bad argument. Well, you know what? You know what? Logical fallacy has never been wrong in the history of logical fallacies. The slippery slope. You start trading your kids with letting them go stay with the homeless couple next door. I'm sure they're great people, but if they're not, you know, well, if they're drug addicted, if they have behavioral health issues, I'm just saying that your kids are going to come with 
come back from the living daylight to beat now, then possibly raped and full of STDs, maybe even hooked on the same drugs that the drug-addled homeless people they're staying with are, were then hooked on. Holy, these people are making me sound like Alex Jones. I don't have a problem sounding like Alex Jones. I don't. But they make me. It's like the people, the people where I work, hey, man, you're an asshole. Well, you know what? I wouldn't be this way if it wasn't for you. You morons driving behind the trailers while I'm trying to back into a dock makes me the way I am. And you wonder why I hate everyone. Huh. Quote, now, I recognize that, that some naysayers will dismiss such a policy as ghastly, even totalitarian, but uh, my proposal is quite modest. A, a, a fusion of traditional philosophy and, and today's c- c- common political obsessions, Matthews writes. Some commenters hypothesize that in that sentence, the writer is channeling his inner Jonathan, Jonathan Swift, an Irish satirist who wrote a satirical essay entitled A Modest Proposal that ex- that explored impoverished families selling their children as food to the wealthy. Matthews writes, The left's introduction of anti-racism and gender identity in schools faces a bitter backlash from parents. His answers to parents being against leftist ideologies being taught in schools, ending parenthood would end the backlash... Helping dismantle white supremacy and and outdated gender norms. Leftist writer explains how abolishing parenthood would benefit Democrats. Huh. Benefiting Democrats. Democrats would also have the opportunity to build a new pillar of the safety net. A child raising system called foster care for all. The writer vilifies Republicans claiming they take immigrant children from their parents and put them in border concentration camps. He asserts that abolishing parenthood is the same as separating children from illegal immigrants at the border and suggests that Republicans will be on board with his universal orphanage proposal. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there because the majority of those children who have been taken from their parents at the border did not arrive with parents at the border. Sure, some of them arrived with people who said they were the parents, who, once kids got across, oh, they're not mine, and left. To go mule more kids back across the border. Some of them, knowing that they wouldn't get deported, they came over with kids, claimed to be their the parents, get over, and, oh, these are my kids, da, da, da. I love my kids so much, I'm out. Deuces, stay with, stay with the border agents, they'll take care of you. It, it's ridiculous. And the idea of foster care for all. Now, I have experience as a foster parent. I say this having three children that I adopted out of foster care a niece and a nephew who live with me that were placed with us through the foster system that we now have guardianship over. My oldest two kids had one heck of a ride. You see, when they were placed with us at the ages of my son being four, my daughter being two, they spent the previous two years bouncing around the foster system. That means my daughter, at the age of two, had already been in six different homes. My son, at the age of four, had been in at least seven or eight. It is not exactly what you would call a stable system. Especially if you are doing this weird thing where you just bounce the kids around from place to place because, well, they've been with they've been with the homeless people out on the corner of of Hayton Ashbury for two weeks. Now let's 
let's have them uh, grab their tent and whatever else they can fit into a backpack, and we're, we're going to send them somewhere else to be raised for by different people for the next couple weeks. That's not exactly a, uh, a proposal that leads to a, a healthy growth for children. The idea of it is sickening, absolutely disgusting. Matthews goes on to mock Justice Amy Coney Barrett for her anti-abortion stance and simply suggests, and instead of aborting children, hand them over to the state, which, again, a far, I think, that's a far worse proposal than the abortion. He goes on to write, a universal orphanhood also dovetails nicely with the pro-life campaign to end abortion rights. In fact, a suggestion from Justice Amy Coney Barrett during a recent case that could overturn Roe inspired this column. She posited that abortion rights are no longer necessary because all 50 states now have safe haven laws, allowing women to turn their babies over to authorities after birth. My proposal would merely make mandatory such handovers of babies to the state. Ah, make mandatory. Doesn't matter what your living conditions are. Doesn't matter what you believe. Doesn't matter, you know, your income levels. Your Are you experiencing homelessness? Doesn't matter. <laughs> ah, can. Ah, congratulations, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, on your beautiful bouncing baby boy. This is Mr. This is Mr. Smith from the Child Protective Service Agency. They are coming to take your baby just because it is mandatory that all children be handed over to the state. Matthews acknowledges that some people may see his radical ideas as dystopian, but adds. You don't pay those critics any mind because they just can't see how our relentless pursuit of equity might birth a brave new world. It's interesting that he would um, go with a brave new world. I don't think Aldous Huxley would really view that as a good thing. But then again, I really don't know what Aldous Huxley's True political leanings were, I mean, Orwell in 1984, he was pro-socialist, but he was very um, against everything that the utopian government of 1984 pushed on the people of that book. All right, I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back, I'm going to talk... Talk about the crazy, crazy people in the Senate who seem to have lost all self-awareness. And then we get into this article out of The Atlantic. Drizzly is the leading home alcohol delivery service available. Imagine being able to sit at home and pull up your smartphone and browse your favorite wine, beer, spirits, and then have it delivered to your home in as little as one hour. Go to drizzly.com or check out the link in the show notes and start shopping today. Not available in all areas? Please drink responsibly. Drizzly.com. So I'm going to talk to you about Built Bar. We've all had protein bars before. Most of them taste like cardboard and they're gross, nasty. It leave a funky aftertaste in your mouth. Built Bar, their goal for starting off was flavor first. Every bar is covered in either pure dark chocolate or white chocolate for those special ones that come out. You have nine regular flavors and then they have the special flavors they bring out every so often. They are absolutely amazing. My, personally, my favorite, mint brownie. Oh, my God. So go to Built.com. Check it out. Go through their selection of Built Bars, Built Go Energy Drink, uh, Built Broth, all their 
all their fine selections of amazing products. Built.com. Use the promo code RELENTLESS to save 10%. Built.com. You know, you would think after having this board for over a year, I would know what the mute button is before I start talking. Ladies and gentlemen, live casting at its finest. But first, it's a new year. People trying to, you know, turn things around about themselves. Maybe trying to, you know, get their health back in order. Maybe they're trying to lose weight. Maybe they want to try something different. Well, I'm not going to tell everybody that the keto diet works for everyone. It doesn't. It takes a lot of discipline. And one of the hardest things about it is figuring out what you can and cannot eat and trying to figure out your macros. And, oh, it's just such a pain. But there's a way to help make it easier. This is a product my wife and I use every day. It is called Keto Chow. Keto Chow is an assortment of shake mixes. You take one serving of your of whatever flavor shake you want to use, you add four ounces of your preferred fat source. It can be MCT oil. It can be avocado oil. It can be melted butter or heavy whipping cream. Either or. Plus, then you add 14 ounces of water. If you're using melted butter, use hot water. Or else you end up with chunks of floating butter. I'm just, I speak from experience. You can mix it up the night before, throw it in the fridge, and it's a quick and easy breakfast. It kind of ties you over through lunch, and it just helps make weight loss that much easier when you can kind of control what's going in. You can prep and be planned ahead. Right now at ketochow.xyz, you use the promo code RELENTLESS. I can save you 10% off your first order. Ketochow.xyz. Keto made easy. All right. So I'll hit this real quick and then I got to get in this other article because it's going to, whoo, it'll make you pull your hair out. Believe me, I have bald patches from just highlighting. So, anyways, the big talk in the Senate this week has been. Filibuster, 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 filibuster. Why filibuster? Well, because the filibuster goes back to Jim Crow era when our fellow Democrats decided they wanted to stand in the way of progress and only wanted to keep the black men down. Huh. Okay. Cool. And this goes all the way back to Russia and how evil they were and doing all these things to help get Donald Trump elected. Uh, uh, It was proven that Russia really didn't have any influence on the election. The fact of the matter is the filibuster is wrong and Russia is evil and so is Donald Trump. Therefore, the filibuster is as evil as Donald Trump and his love child with Russia. Oh, okay, okay, stop. You're not making any sense. Especially the fact you consider that in all this talk about killing the filibuster because it's so anti-democracy. Fun fact. We don't have a democracy. We have a representative republic. A constitutional republic at that. So if the Senate says... Hey, you know what? For these really big issues, we need to have a 60 vote, a 60 vote majority for it to pass. There's a reason. Perhaps the holdouts who are in the minority, that one guy, you know, coming out through, uh, that one guy who's willing to stand. You know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington style and be he he should be the sixtieth vote, but by God, I'm gonna stand up there and talk till I die. That's it exists for a reason. So that way you can have people 
if the minority doesn't want to push it and they can and they can stand in the way and and I'm and I support Democrats having the filibuster to push push back against Republican stuff that they want to get through. And that's how the system works. It has worked since, you know, we established the Congress. Well, this week, Senator Ted Cruz, he proposed a bill that would put sanctions against Russia for over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. For those of you who do not know, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline moves natural gas from Russia to Germany. Donald Trump, being so being such a Russian stooge, he would not agree to uh, allowing the Nord Stream 2 to be built. Because, you know, he was in Russia's pocket and he's going to do Vladimir Putin's bidding. So he would not let them build the pipeline. Just like he also was so in the pocket of big Russia that he gave kinetic weaponry to Ukraine because he loves Russia so much he gave the Ukrainians javelin missiles. Huh. But anywho's Ted Cruz brings this bill to the floor that would have been sanctions against Russia. And the Democrats immediately pulled the filibuster. Yes, that's right. They pulled the racist filibuster that they don't agree with. The filibuster is so evil unless we need to use it because uh, we don't like your sanctions. We're going to go with these sanctions that aren't really sanctions at all. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. There is, I've always said politicians lack any and all self-awareness and they just keep proving that statement true. Time and time again, they say what they want, they say what they need to get elected, and then immediately ignore it. They get, they are on tape saying, I will never do this, and then they do it. They say, I will prevent this from happening, and then they go along with it. There is zero self awareness in politics. Those that are self aware, they become outcasts. Rand Paul is an outcast because he actually stands on what he believes. He is willing to push back against his own side. Rand Paul did not support the sanctions on the belief that they didn't do enough. Which is good. I appreciate him having a stand that is based on a principle. Not just... Ah, uh, it's uh, the other guys over there. Uh, the other guys. Uh, we we can't support the other guys. It's insane. But the fact that you know they talk about how awful the filibuster is, and then they immediately use it because you know we we can kill the filibuster to put in our Supreme Court and nominees. We can kill the filibuster, put in our judicial nominees nominees okay cool elections have consequences bubba keep that in mind and then what happens <gasps> elections had consequences and now republican republicans were running the senate for a minute i'm a poet and didn't know it and because harry reed had killed off the 60 boat the 60 vote uh, majority needed to seat uh, judicial nominees. Oh my gosh. Republicans put all sorts of people into the judiciary and the Supreme Court. It's insanity. But hey, when the Democrats decide they're going to kill the filibuster, which I doubt they'll have the votes for, seeing as how Kirsten Jill Kirsten Gillibrand, wrong Kirsten, Kirsten Cinema has vowed to not support killing off the filibuster. Hopefully, hopefully she stands up to that. She stands up to the pressure that's being put on her from all sides of the left. Now, 
to the story du jour. Fit this in in the last 20 minutes here. That's what she said. All right. This is from The Atlantic. Headline, The Culture War Has Warped the Supreme Court's Judgment. This is from Mr. Adam Serwer, a staff writer for The Atlantic. All right, I'm going to do the best I can. There's It's 10 pages. I've tried to highlight selected things. I, every, I think I dipped all 10 pages in uh, yellow highlighter ink, so it's a lot. So he writes that the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which authorizes the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to act in an emergency capacity when workers face grave danger from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful or from new hazards, (gasps) and when such emergency standards is necessary to protect employees from such danger. You might think the Biden administration's vaccine mandate stood a good chance of surviving the Supreme Court's review. But if you were watching Fox News at all over the past year, you would have been guessed that it was doomed. You would have guessed it was doomed. So it goes on to say, the Supreme Court blocked the Biden administration's mandate, which compelled companies with more than 100 employees to require their workers to be vaccinated against COVID-19 or tested regularly. Yes, because why 100? Why not 200? Why not five? Why not 17? Because 100 is an arbitrary number. That alone should be reason like, yeah, you can't even give us a reason why 100. Why is 100 people the, the minimum? Why is that the threshold we should be going through? But I digress. The majority's reasoning is that because hazards of COVID-19 is present outside the work... Oh, wait, hold on. Is it require, required vaccinate workers be vaccinated against COVID-19 or test regularly? Uh, majority's reasoning is that because the hazard of COVID-19 is present outside the workplace, OSHA exceeded the authority it has, it has to regulate workplace safety, which it really does. Me, being at home while my kids go to school, my kids could contract it, come home, incubate it, get sick, start shedding the virus, and then make me sick without me ever having set foot at my place of work. Quote, COVID-19 can and does spread at home, in schools, during sporting events, and everywhere else that people gather. That kind of universal risk is no different from the day-to-day dangers that all face from crime, air pollution, or any number of communicable diseases. End quote. That is from the uh, unsigned opinion piece. Or the unsigned opinion that the court released. He goes on to say, this is la- that is laughable logic. OSHA regulates many hazards that are also present outside the workplace. The fact that you could die in a fire in your apartment is not an argument against regulating fire hazards in factories or offices. Okay, and that's a bad argument. Because whoever has the lease on that building, whoever owns that business, they have an inherent responsibility to protect employees. Whether OSHA mandates it or not. And here's the thing. If I'm not at work and the building catches on fire, nah, it doesn't, doesn't affect me other than I don't have a place to go to work tomorrow. So the, that whole argument is bad. It's like just because, it's like if I'm, I'm, I'm an avid shooter, if just because I'm an avid shooter doesn't mean that the police and OSHA cannot have regulations, you know, that pertain to storing firearms for a police department. If I was a cop, 
you know, if the, if OSHA says, okay, here's X, Y, and Z, you have to do for firearm safety, you know, you have to do X number of hours training. You have to do, you have to do all of this stuff in the name of firearm safety. Just because I can shoot myself in the foot while I'm at home doesn't mean that they can't stop. They can't have this uh, go against me at work. It's it's a horrible argument. Yes, there is stuff that just because I'm at risk of it at home doesn't mean they they don't have a right to regulate it at work. I have I have cleaning chemicals at, at my house. That doesn't mean that you know OSHA can't say here's how you have to store your hazardous materials at work. It, it's Again, it's an asinine argument that's not based on anything other than, uh, oh, my God, just because. Moreover, unlike attending a sporting event as a spectator, people have to go to work, unless they're lucky enough to, to be, say, a Supreme Court justice, in which case you can work remotely. Yeah, you know what? who else can work remotely? Opinion piece writers for crap publications like The Atlantic. I guarantee you, you still haven't seen the inside of an office, good sir. Not in some time. One of the motivations that he says is uh, that vaccine cannot be undone at the end of the workday. Similar concurring opinion written by Justice Neil Gorsuch portrays vaccination as, quote, a medical procedure that affects people's lives outside the workplace. Well... It does. If I have a bad reaction that leaves me, you know, that leaves me dead because work said I had to have it, that pretty has a pretty big damper on uh, my life outside of work. If I get, if because of a work mandate, I got the jab and then I developed myocarditis and ended up having to have a heart have a heart transplant because of the shot. That it has a pretty big effect outside of work. In their dissent from the decision upholding the mandate for healthcare workers, Justices Gorsuch, Thomas, Barrett, and Alito insisted that these cases are not about the efficacy or importance of COVID nineteen vaccines. While describing the vaccine or test requirement as forcing healthcare workers to undergo a medical procedure they do not want and cannot undo. Again, if I go to work and they tell me I have to remove my testicles to remain an employee in good standing, that would definitely fall fall in as a uh, medical procedure that I do not want and cannot undo. Oh, and it says, uh, never mind, the OSHA rule allowed for those who didn't want the vaccine to simply get tested regularly. Ah, uh, yes. And, and what happens when your place of employment runs out of tests? What happens if you can't get at-home tests that you can take and go, oh, I'm negative. See, here's my negative COVID test from this morning. What happens then? Then you can't work until someone gets tests, whether it be your employer or you. He goes on to talk about the political and cultural shifts. I mean, it, it's a bad argument when you start talking cultural shifts, especially with certain justices like, I don't know, Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito, who've been there for forever. They've held a consistent state. They've held a consistent line the entire time that they have been in that position. Oh, they're just going with the times, man. The article goes on to essentially say that the justices are no better than Jenny McCarthy saying that the MMR vaccine gave her son autism. Fun fact, it didn't. And that, like, and it goes on to suggest that, like Donald Trump, these justices are so over the top 
and they are so tuned into the conservative base because the conservatives are going to vote for these Supreme Court judges. They watch Fox News on the daily, and they get their talking points and their marching orders from the ratings of Fox News on polling that says they like when they do this, they don't like when they do this. Okay, they like it when we rule this way, so we're going to rule in favor of this. Well, if that was the case, if that was the case, how come how come the uh the the bake the cake bigot guy why was why was the ruling saying that he was unconstitutionally targeted so narrow? Why wasn't it a sweeping You have the right with your intellectual property to deny service to anyone for any reason. Because that's what the conservatives were saying in polling on Fox News. I, this is, this article is 10 pages is filled with so much. It's beyond misinformation. It's, It's, Straight up lazy argumentation. He equates being anti mandate with being anti vax. Again, saying that, yeah, if you want the shot, you can get it, but I'm not going to. Or I got the shot, but you didn't, but that's cool too. He, it, wait, wait, wait. You want to make that guy get the shot? Hell no, I don't think so. If, you can't force that on him. He's equating that to MMR causes autism. He's equating that to there's so much mercury used in it. That's why that's why it's rotting kids' brains and they get the polio vaccine, man. Is it, it it it's lazy writing. And and there there's he goes on to reference uh questions about well how dare you how dare you suggest that you know well in in 2015 because people were being all anti-vaccine there was a measles outbreak at disneyland and this illustrated the importance of mass vaccination to obtain herd immunity and suppress disease well i have a question what is the breakthrough infection rate of measles, mumps, or rubella on the populace who has been vaccinated? What is the breakthrough breakthrough infection rate of polio, of smallpox? Flu vaccines, we know what the breakthrough rate is on it, about 50%. I can get a flu shot and still get the flu because the flu shot, eh, they really don't know. They guess which strain it's going to be every year, A or B. 40% of the time they guess wrong or they only get right 40% of the time. I misstated that. But he he, he made some, uh, had some quotes uh, from Christopher Aiken and Larry Bartles from Democracy for Realists. Democracy for Realists. This guy is clearly not. That when voters with strong political identities, quote, consider new issues or circumstances, they often do so not in order to challenge and revise their fundamental commitments, but in order to bolster the, those commitments by constructing preferences or beliefs consistent with them. They sound like they are thinking, and they feel like they are thinking. We all do. This author includes this quote, but doesn't seem to have any self-awareness because he's doing exactly what this quote is saying. When confronted with evidence that, uh, yeah, this vaccine is really not working that well. Ah, you're just anti-vax. And then they they silo themselves. They push themselves further and further into a corner they can't paint themselves out of. But surely the sophisticated legal minds make up the Supreme Court are resistant to this sort of crude rationalization. The truth is the reverse. As Aiken and Bartles write, 
political rationalization is often most powerful among people who are well-informed and politically engaged, since their fundamental political commitments tend to be most consistent and strongly held. Then in parentheses, in fairness, this is probably as true of opinion journalists as it is of Supreme Court justices. Again, that may have been a kind of a backhanded shot at himself, acknowledging that maybe he's not even any better. But I'm sure this guy locks himself in a small closet and after eating a pot of beans so he can smell his own farts and enjoy the, enjoy the show. Enjoy the show. Oh, my God. I need more whiskey. So enjoy the smell. And again, like I said, what's the breakthrough rate on all these vaccines? And say so again, he goes on this stupid thing to talk about how you know if you're anti mandate, you are equally anti whatever, anti take the vax. Have you read what's in those vials, man? Okay, that is a completely different argument than I had the shot. I did it voluntarily. You shouldn't have to come at me and say under under the threat of force, you're going to get this. But I think really where this guy shows his complete lack of any awareness, political or historical, comes out of this paragraph. With all the with all the sophistication of a bong rip in a dorm room, the majority writes, "quote It is telling that OSHA, in its half century of existence, has never before adopted a broad public health regulation of this kind, addressing a threat that is untethered in any casual sense from the workplace, because it is untethered from the workplace." If I don't work at a facility with asbestos, but I have an old house that has asbestos, uh, you know, as, asbestos sheeting on the outside of the house as an insulation. OSHA doesn't have doesn't have a right to come into my house and tell me I have to wear a respirator to protect from mesothelioma because I, if I do work with that crap. It, at my place of employment, and they can say, hey, there's asbestos, you're going to wear a respirator so you don't get lung cancer. I come home to a house with asbestos in the walls. They don't. They can't come to my house and tell me that same thing as well. They can tell my place of business, hey, you have to have a fire escape plan, you have to have this kind of fire suppression system, but they can't do it to my house. Because it's not occupational. But I digress. Setting aside the false notion that regulating workplaces where COVID spreads easily is untethered, air quotes, from the workplace, was there in that half century a once in a century pandemic that fi- killed nearly a million Americans? The majority's slippery slope is bulldozed flat by its own argument. The fact that OSHA has never before issued such a regulation is itself a reflection of the unique circumstances of the moment. And here is the crux of the entire stupid of the article. Reacting to a moment. You see... We've had lots of these moments over the years, these unique circumstances. Like, oh, we need better better communication between intel agencies because, because you know, we need to find out who's getting radicalized by crazy Islamists and flying planes in the buildings. We got the Patriot Act. December 6th, 1941, a little, little story for you. About one of the first civilian and one of the first men killed fighting against the Japanese. 
He was a Hawaiian dude. There was a plane that was sh- that was shot down and it crashed into one of the outer one of the outer islands of Hawaii. The Japanese pilot was rescued from the plane. An old Japanese man who still viewed himself as Japanese was talking to him. The pilot told him what was going on. He took him to a home with some Japanese Hawaiians and was told, hey, we're going to send someone to this island over here to get someone from the army to come catch, come take this guy's POW. They saw a fellow Japanese man. They believed in the empire. And so they took up arms against their fellow Hawaiians. It ended with the old man being arrested because he knew what was going on. He knew he was told in Japanese, yeah, as part of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the the farmer and his wife, who were also Japanese, um, yeah, they died. They died fighting to protect this Japanese man who was also killed in the struggle as well. But they they used this, this little action, this little skirmish on a far-off island that wasn't even part of Pearl Harbor for someone who was already looking for a reason to start start getting rid of Japanese people off the West Coast because, you know... uh, you had that whole oil embargo with uh, Japan, and they they might be uh, empire loyalists, even though they say they're Americans. I just need some reason, some unique circumstance of a moment to be able to, to deal with it. Well, he got it on December 6, 1941. Within days, he had the executive order author- authorizing the internment of Japanese Americans on the West Coast. Because just, this is one of those things where you never let a crisis go to waste. You never turn down the opportunity of a unique set of circumstances in a moment to push through an agenda to make things happen. That's the crux of it. It took eight pages. Took eight pages to get to that. They want to use this as another 9 11. They want to use this as another December 6th, 1941. They want to use this to push something much worse than vaccine mandates through because if they can mandate vaccines in your workplace what else can they what else can they get through well i mean uh, we we did you did this because we said it was important so now we're asking you to do this it's also important there's so much that goes into this there's so much to be said for arguments that are that are slippery slopes that turn out they're usually pretty accurate There's because a status is going to state, period, end of story. And they will use whatever means, good or ill, legal or eh, maybe skirting it just a smidge, to get through what they want to get through, to establish their ability to control you. All right, that's going to wrap it up for tonight. Again, those of you in the live chat, thank you for tuning in and listening live. Those of you who are listening on your favorite podcast platform, please do me a favor, especially if it's the uh, the Apple podcast. Please hit that subscribe button, then you'll get the show every week when it posts. Then I need you to 
please, please, don't need, I'm asking you nicely, to hit that five-star rating. I'll accept four. Three and below, we need to have a conversation because, you know, we're obviously not on the same page. You probably shouldn't be listening to this show. But, hey, thank you for listening anyways. After you rate it, please write a nice review. Tell people why you like the show. Make, pick on me, make fun of me, and, and, you know, in good humor and good faith, and I will have a chuckle when I have a chance to read them. That, that's how I am. And finally, please share this podcast. Send it to someone who you think will be entertained, will be interested. Someone who's open-minded, willing to think about things from a different point of view. Or send it to that entrenched leftist who this is just going to piss them off. I don't care. I will be a tool for your aggravation of your leftist friends. Again, thank you so much for listening, and as always, stay relentless. This is Relentless Dairy on Podbean.com.